Hello and good afternoon. My name is Erin Wagoner and I'm a specialist in corporate partner services with Chime. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, A Model for Digital Transformation. Before we get started with the presentation, I'm just gonna cover a few technical details. The Q&A area is located on your lower panel bar and that will allow you to ask questions during today's presentation. To ask a question, type your message into the Q&A chat box and press set the send key. So this session is gonna be a little bit different. We are inviting all attendees to ask their questions during the session. So please, if you have a question that comes up during the session, just type it in. Our speakers are gonna try and answer what they can during the session. And if we have any that come in near the end, we'll answer those as best we can. If we can't get to all the questions, don't worry, we'll be sure to do reach out post session. Now, if you're having difficulty listening to the live audio stream through your computer speakers, teleconferencing is available. To display the teleconference instructions, simply, ah, simply click on the audio option on the lower panel bar. Also, don't forget, by attending today's session, you will earn up to one continuing education credit. Just need to visit the Chime website for more details. Also, please take a moment to complete the evaluation that's gonna automatically pop up at the end of the session. We really appreciate your guys' feedback on our programming and it helps us know what to offer you in the future. As a reminder, all attendees will receive a copy of the slides and a link to the session recording following this webinar. With that said, I'm pleased to introduce today Ed Marks, Chief Digital Officer with the HCI Group, and Patty, CEO of Demo, Damon Demo Consulting Incorporated. Ed and Patty, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna turn things over to you. For that introduction, uh, Patty and I are very excited to share with you a little bit about our analysis and experience with digital transformation, and in particular, share with you a model that you may find helpful. And before we go there, I just wanna say thank you to Chime, thank you, Aaron for the opportunity. Chime has been instrumental in my own professional growth. I've become a fellow of, Ch of Chime and then a lifetime fellow of Chime. And all along the route of my career, it's been Chime as my go-to in terms of helping me with my leadership development, helping me with my networking, and I'm very, very thankful. So with that, we'll jump right into the content. So, Aaron already introduced us. You can read that at your leisure or look us up on LinkedIn. We first wanna talk about what is digital. So in the top 10 list of CEOs, digital transformation tends to be either in the number one or number two spot. And then when you talk about digital transformation with peers or even the member, a fellow member of the C-suite, you ask, what is digital transformation? And there's no real solid definition. Our point and our belief is that you just need to define it with your organization, what it means for you, so that you have this common language. So when someone in the, one of your peers talks about digital transformation of your particular hospital health system, you all know what you're talking about. So there's no need to find the perfect definition. Just work with the definition that works best for your organization. Now that said, uh, both Patty and I, as we developed a book called Healthcare Digital Transformation, which I'll mention in a second, we do suggest a definition based on a lot of research that we did. And then we also offer our own, our personal definition. And so you can see it right there. I won't read the screen to you, but you can see how out of the book, how we define digital transformation. And again, the purpose there was just everyone reading the book understand when we say digital transformation, this is in particular what we mean. So that's how we felt about it. And you can see our personal response. We do have a book coming out. It was to be released about this time, but because of the pandemic, we rewrote and weaved in concepts that became more clear and crystallized in terms of digital transformation because of the pandemic. So that's definition. So what Aaron mentioned was the questions. We will take questions anytime along the way. So don't feel you need to wait for the end. Uh, wanna make this as interactive as possible. That's one of the beauties of having this be live is we can really pivot in terms of meeting your expectations 
for today. So I'm going to introduce the model right here, and then we're going to go into a, another level of detail along with uh, Patty. So the reason for the model is, okay, we defined as an organization what digital transformation is, but how do you actually get there? How do you develop a strategy? And again, first you have to define it, why I spent time on that slide, but now that you defined it, what's the model? So in my, with my previous employer, I was not only the chief information officer, but I was responsible for digital transformation and strategy. And so we tried to figure out what is the model. And so based on my experiences and then Patty's experiences helping other organizations with digital transformation, and like I said, a lot of research, a lot of interviews, this is what we've come up with. And so it centers around the experience. It's all about human-centered design. And I think we all know that now, and we all talk a lot about it, but it definitely has to be at the core and at the center. So that's why in bold letters, we talk about, hey, in the middle of everything, it's all about the experience. So when we talk about experience, we really talk about seven different personas. Now, if there's one that we don't address, please mention it in your Q&A so that uh, we can talk about it here because it's quite possible we've missed something. This is just a model. It's not the end all be all. It's meant to be a tool that anyone can use. So you'll have access to this as Aaron said, you'll have access to it. You can take it, you can modify it to fit your particular situation, but at least you have a template of some sort to start from. And that's really the goal. So we talk about experience and human centered design. So what are the personas? Now, a lot of times it's pretty easy to think about patients, right? That's obvious. Okay. Patients. And then the next obvious one is the providers. So the actual clinical people who are taking care of the patient. But now we're going to go into other areas that others may not have thought about. And we really believe in a holistic approach to healthcare. So, that's why we call these out specifically. So the next one is a caregiver. So these are people who are taking care of the patient, especially not only while they're in the hospital, but especially once discharged. So these are other caregivers. It could be friends, family, partners. So what about their experience? What about the organization experience in terms of how do you digitally transform your organization and the way it works? then you must because it's part of i would say everyone's mission statement or values is the community so hospitals are inside of communities and exist in large part to serve that community so how are you enabling a experience a digital experience with your community and for some the brand is really important so how do you digitally enable the brand because you may be more than just for your your local community which is great and the brand still important but for some, it might be a regional brand or a multi-state brand or national or global. And the final area is really the concept of partnership. So this is other businesses, typically sort of business to business, maybe through supply chain or, or, or individuals that you work with, companies you work with, and you wanna make sure they have a good digital experience with yourself as well. So I've done a lot of intro just now, just to get us to, uh, get us inside of the model, but I'm gonna stop, pause there, and ask Patty. Patty, I, I just did a big intro. I probably missed some things. If you wanna fill in some gaps, please do, as we talk about the experience and the model and the personas. Thank you, Ed. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on, uh, on this webinar. It's always a pleasure to join you uh, on these online events. And of course, thank you to Chime for hosting us and for giving us the opportunity. I think, uh, I think uh, it goes without saying that in the past few months, uh, we have seen some dramatic changes in the way healthcare is being accessed and delivered. And I think going forward, some of these changes are gonna be permanent. Uh, we are obviously seeing a big shift towards telehealth and virtual care models and you referred to some of that in your previous slide. Uh, we are also going to see uh, big changes in the way consumers access care and uh, the kind of tools that they are now going to be provided in order to have a seamless experience in uh, accessing the care and in getting treated 
uh, we're going to see a lot of changes in the way patient populations are, are managed remotely, especially uh, those with chronic conditions and so on. So the virtualization of care, for want of a better term, is, is the big theme that is playing out. Uh, it, it was always there. It, it's been gaining ground over the last few years. But the pandemic did something uh, to really put it over the top. And we are going to see, we are seeing an acceleration of the changes that drive uh, virtual care experiences. And a big part of routine, low acuity care is going to shift towards uh, virtual care models. And so that's going to be interesting to see. And obviously that plays into what kind of digital transformation initiatives health systems choose to fund and invest in. Uh, and what kind of experiences consumers now begin to demand in light of the uh, you know, pandemic. And we go into a lot of that and how that is driving and accelerating change uh, in our book that's coming out in August. So I, those are a couple of initial comments and we'll talk more about this as we go along in this conversation. So what we will do is, is sort of unpack the model with some examples. We're not gonna go through every piece of the model is quite comprehensive, but we will pick out maybe uh, one to three sort of subcategories for each of these major, we'll call them platforms, like culture is a platform, automation is a platform, applications and, and so forth. So under each of those, when you double click, like you see here in this slide for culture, there's a couple of things and we'll highlight those. Now, if we don't highlight one that you're interested in, uh, please again, use the Q and A and uh, Patty and I, or I, or Aaron will be look, checking, that, checking that out and making sure that we address your particular questions. The, the interesting thing too, Patty, that I failed to mention is sort of to complete this model, we, we had a unique opportunity, not only uh, Patty, you specifically, a lot of empirical research and a lot of interviews, but we also brought together many companies that are leaders in their particular specialties to sort of perfect the model. And I wanted to give you a couple of examples. They're actually sister companies of the HCI group under the Tech M umbrella. And one is called Pin and Farina. And they've actually uh, been very instrumental in terms of physical design around the globe. So they've done everything from Ferraris to Olympic torches, uh, the list goes on but the importance of physical design could not be diminished. Uh, and I know we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, so that's about as far as I'll go with that. Another instrumental company that's been very helpful in the development of this model is MadPow, and, and they're based out of Boston, and they are uh, arguably in the top uh, tier of firms that specialize in the user experience. And so bringing that thought pattern and way of work and processes has been vital. And I think the, the last one, and again, we'll touch on these maybe a little bit more later on, is a company called Born. They're based out of New York City. But again, these are all global companies, but expertise in, in, in digital design. And the reason that one's so important is, is that a lot of what we're talking about is the engagement and the experience. So you have to be very, very intentional on the design. And so about 25% of any website that all of us use on a daily basis is actually designed um, by the Born Group. So, so we had a lot of excellent input, which is what helped get this model to where it is. So let's talk culture. Patty, you know, what do you think when you think about culture and, and your experience working with various customers, what, which of these sort of jump out at you that you would like to sort of double down on and, and speak about? Yeah. Yeah, so my firm, uh, Demo Consulting, uh, as you know, Ed, uh, we, you know, we did a lot of work for you when in, in your previous uh, role as Chief Digital Officer of a large health system. And we continue to do similar work with other health systems as well. One of the things that we're noticing now is the need to be agile in uh, everything that you do. And I, I don't mean agile in the sense of agile software development necessarily, because it has a very specific connotation in the world of software development. But I'm talking about agile as a, as a guiding principle, agile as a philosophy, if you will, in how you approach digital transformation. So, you know, gone are the days when you would uh, take uh, forever to, you know, decide on your technology strategy, go through a, you know, funding and investment process, 
take a partner, you know, take 18 months to implement a big platform. All of those days are gone. Everything is now about agility without losing the structure and the rigor of a well thought through strategy and uh, an implementation approach. Uh, you also want to remain agile. So you experiment, you don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, but at the same time, you build on, uh, you know, small successes, if you will, and uh, make sure that you get it right before you move on to the next one. And if something doesn't work, you know, you can quickly move on to the next one without losing a lot of time or, uh, or money. And so this agile mindset, uh, this approach to making rapid progress in uh, smaller, you know, bite-sized increments, if you will, I think is gaining ground in, in a lot of ways. And it's also partly driven by the, the technology marketplace, you know, the digital health startups and the, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the firms that are agile in their own way of functioning, they are, I think, driving a lot of this culture change within the health system. So I think it's coming together very nicely. And of course, the marketplace is now demanding a very different kind of a healthcare experience altogether in the wake of the pandemic. So all of that is coming to, so if, if there was one thing I'd pick in this list, I would say it's agility. And, and we talk about that uh, in the book and we go into that in a fair amount of detail with a lot of anecdotes uh, from our work as well as from the interviews that we've done. Yeah, and I, I would agree with you, Patty, on Agile probably being the top in that, in that list. The other one is one that we've struggled with for years and years and years, which is change management. And there's all sorts of good philosophies out there and good models that you can use like Cotter's eight steps. Uh, but whatever the model is that you use, there really always has to be this uh, focused uh, awareness of the importance of change management because we all know and we probably all experience where you could have the best design, you can have the best product and services and you think everything's you know best project management and then uh, it's not adopted uh, and that goes back to the sort of the cultural transformation and change management. So those are a couple other areas where you really need to spend a significant amount of time just to make sure you have that piece Right. So let's move to automation. Patty, what, what, are, what are some areas here where you're seeing digital transformation occur in healthcare in terms of automation? Uh, I think uh, if I had to pick one, and all of these are, by the way, uh, very, very pertinent in the context of digital transformation in healthcare. But if there's one theme that I would pick in this list, uh, it would be artificial intelligence, uh, simply because you know, data and analytics is driving uh, healthcare uh, diagnosis decisions uh, and treatment decisions in a big way, but it's also now beginning to uh, play a very big role in how you manage populations, especially by looking at data from multiple sources and aggregating them and analyzing them uh, and applying advanced analytics tools such as AI, such as natural language processing uh, to really understand your patient populations and and you know, intervene in a timely manner in order to keep them healthy, in order to intervene if there's an emergency. Uh, it, it's playing into the theme of remote monitoring that I spoke about in a very big way. And I feel that it is also now going to play a role in, uh, in driving uh, consumer experiences or access to care, in, in predicting things like, you know, predicting a, a need for care even before the you know, consumers uh, or patients feel that there is a need for care. So I think AI is going to play out in a big way uh, in, in, in the coming uh, quarters. Yeah, and I, I would also add robotic process automation. So, because I know the conundrum right now, because it wasn't, uh, it was just a few months ago that I was in the CIO suite seat in terms of uh, on the provider side. And it was the same, uh, it's gotten heightened now with uh, because the economic fallout related to the pandemic. But even before then, it was always doing a couple things. One is uh, lower the cost of IT, lower the cost of technology, lower the cost of operations, while adding additional services and capabilities. And it is doable. To live in that bimodal world is absolutely doable. And one of the ways to take cost out of an organization is through RPA or robotic process automation. So, I, I always encourage everyone to take a look at it. There's a lot of, I mean, the low hanging fruit, sort of uh, the back office type of functions. And I, I know many of my colleagues, uh, some of whom are listening right now who have done RPA and done it successfully. They're able to 
pull out significant costs, give back those dollars to the organization to continue to fulfill the mission and vision while carving out some to do uh, the next level of virtual health. So RPA thinks good, artificial intelligence uh, is spot on. Like you said, Patty, all of these are good. Otherwise they wouldn't have made the list for the model. Uh, we, had to, we probably had 20 or 30 for each uh, and just try to get it down to a manageable size. So applications, uh, why don't we do the same thing, Patty? We'll each pick, pick one and uh, talk about it a little bit deeper and then we'll move on to infrastructure. Uh, let me pick one, uh, you know, again, they're all uh, very, very pertinent in the context of digital transformation. Uh, let me go with the one at the top, which is application rationalization. As you know, and uh, Ed, you've been a healthcare CIO for longer than most, and you've seen more than most of us have. And you know that uh, over time, uh, healthcare environments uh, kind of accumulate a lot of applications. And uh, over time, these applications, you know, firstly, they don't talk to one another, and they also often do the same thing, but in different parts of the organization. So it ends up uh, creating a lot of friction within the system because you want to make sure that you know, all the systems are talking to one another, but you also want to make sure that you don't have more than you need and uh, you're reducing the, uh, the footprint to a manageable level in order to contain the cost, in order to make the operations more seamless. Uh, that I think is a big opportunity area and it may not sound like digital transformation, but anything you can do to you know, reduce the footprint and reduce your integration touch points and uh, enable seamless experiences uh, for the patient at the end of the day, uh, it is definitely going to play a role in uh, in your in, in getting to your future state faster. So while APRAT may not sound like digital transformation, it is it, it has great value and it can really enable the kind of mandate that uh, the C-suite is dealing with in trying to get uh, uh, to create seamless patient experiences. Yeah, and again, I, it's so easy to talk about any, any one of these because they're all so important. I'll just stress on value-based care enablement. We all know it and we sort of rely on the vendors, uh, you know, our electronic health record vendors to provide that sort of capability. But I think it's gonna become more and more important now in the future. I think we're gonna see us move a little bit with a higher sense of velocity towards value-based care. So you wanna make sure that uh, you can't rely necessarily just on your electronic health record vendor. You're really gonna to have to pull out all the stops as many of, almost everyone has, probably everyone has in terms of uh, virtual care and things like that. So those are a couple areas to really pay attention to. Infrastructure, I think most of our audience is pretty good with uh, infrastructure. I won't comment on any. Patty, if you want to just mention one briefly uh, that you think is worth highlighting that our audience may not be as familiar with, and then we'll move on to analytics. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, cloud is the one thing that I would say uh, all, all uh, digital transformation uh, executives need to be looking at. First of all, a lot of the new solutions that you're going to buy to enable your digital engagement with your patients and consumers they're going to be cloud native solutions. So, you know, cloud it has to be a part of your strategy, but it's also, there's also opportunity there in migrating your existing workloads to the cloud. And all of that has to be evaluated carefully. I would say one thing though, that uh, you, have to, you have to look at the economics uh, carefully and uh, there isn't a straightforward answer when it comes to cloud, uh, but there is of course a lot of benefits. So by being selective, I think you can get a lot of benefit out of it. Yeah, and hopefully we are skipping through this portion because again, the audience should be fairly adept at this, but make sure, go down each one of those, make sure you have something in place that's working, that you're emphasizing, you've got a team on, because again, we're, we're in sort of this bimodal where we have to take out costs for the organization and there's a lot of ways of doing it, especially in infrastructure and here's uh, several of them. So let's talk about analytics and not to keep putting pressure on you, Patty, but you actually wrote a book on yeah. analytics. So let me uh, let you go first on this one and highlight. Yeah, it. yeah, sure. So, so my first book, uh, The Big Unlock, was about data and analytics and how that is driving uh, uh, digital health experiences. And uh, the book, the book came out in 2017. Seems like a really long time ago in technology years, 
but a lot of the things that uh, I had said in the book, which was also, you know, which was based on lots of interviews that I did with folks such as yourself. And of course, you were kind enough to write a foreword for the book tour, I must mention. A lot of those have played out really well. And I talked just a little while ago about artificial intelligence. I made a big, big bet in that book that AI was going to play a huge role in uh, digital transformation in healthcare. And, and that is certainly playing out. We are, uh, and I also had stated that you know, we're going to see lots of new sources of data and uh, those sources are going to increase. They're going to become more complex, but they're going to ultimately deliver better experiences. A lot of that is playing out as we speak. You know, data sources are definitely increasing. Uh, we're getting different sources, of, you know, different types of data. The volumes of data uh, have gone up, but technology has also kept pace. I think it's relatively uh, straightforward now to you know to think about having the ability basically on tap to create the kind of data management infrastructure that you need in order to drive your analytics programs and to drive your patient experiences. So yeah, I would say as a you know as a theme, data and analytics has definitely come along in a big way, and uh, it's going to continue to play a very big role going forward. There's no question about it. Yeah, and as, as I make a comment, I'm going to talk about qualitative research, and, and there, there is a move towards, for those who are from, a, from academia, and even if you're not an official academic medical center, uh, there's probably a lot of individuals doing uh, research. Uh, we were one of the first to hire in my previous role a chief or research information officer, so that's something to think about, uh, because the data needs are, are very large, are, are somewhat unique, it really helped to have a focus specifically on that. So that's, that's sort of a, an emerging trend you might want to think about. Patty, as I head into strategy, I know there's several questions. I'm not able to, to grab those questions. So if, as I start talking about strategy, if you or Aaron are able to, and there's something for us to address, then please, please let me know. So strategy is really important. And none of these are in a particular order, although I do believe culture definitely is the first thing that you have to deal with whenever you talk about any sort of transformation, but you definitely need to have a strategy. And in that strategy, you know, it are things that you, you would assume like enterprise architecture should be, be hand in glove with strategy, but you need to have a strategy and that would include journey mapping. So that's, that's what I'll offer here before we move to product development. And that is, you need to take the personas. So whatever personas you have, again, we introduced you to seven, you might have more. A lot of people develop subcategories of personas like under patient, you might have, you know, just an outpatient and an inpatient, but whatever that the case may be, it's really valuable. And it's just part of human centered design to go through journeys. And, and so there's software enablement for doing this. You can do it the old fashioned way with sticky notes, but it's really important to include your patients when we talk about the experience. So we've talked a lot, we've been sort of a little bit technical, a little bit on C-suite type leadership, but as you do these roadmaps and strategic plans and, and journey maps, include your patients. Uh, I was fortunate again, where I come from, where that was very well facilitated. We had an organization that did precisely that, but even if you don't, and I've been in other organizations that didn't have anything formalized, we reached out directly. So reach out to your patients, ask them, reach out to your caregivers, whoever your personas are, and include them. And obviously the clinicians. So everything we do is you do should be patient and clinician driven. So include the right stakeholders so that when you come out of this, you have the complete buy-in. And that goes back to culture and the things we talked about there. So let's talk a little bit about product development. So product development, and Patty, I'll ask you if you want to grab one of these, but I'll introduce this, is not for every organization, and we understand that. Uh, there are some organizations that are very large and sophisticated and have incredible capabilities to develop their own products and make investments and things of that nature. Others, not so much. But I will tell you this, in my experience, in my role in the last six months, I've run into hospitals that are 25-bed uh, hospitals, and they have created amazing products um, so I think it goes that it doesn't mean be, you have to be large in order to do this. And sometimes it'll just make sense to monetize something or develop a product. So 
Uh, any comments here, Patty? You know, I think uh, you're right to add uh, that uh, not every company is set up to be a product company and it's, it takes a certain kind of uh, uh, structure, organizational structure, if you will, and a certain approach to product development, uh, when you, especially when you think about technology firms and the way they go about developing and marketing products. But at the same time, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't preclude uh, healthcare organizations from adopting a product mindset. And what that means is really think about it and think about every solution, every uh, use case, uh, every need with a, with a product management mindset. What is it that your customers actually need? And you, you alluded to this in the previous slide, we talked about patient journey maps and so on. What do your consumers really need? Do you really understand their patient, uh, their journeys, whether they're patients or whether they're caregivers for that matter? And within that journey, what, what aspects of those journeys can we, ad can we address through a particular feature functionality or solution? And uh, how will that make a difference to the organization as well as to the consumer? Oh. And so the product management mindset uh, can very well be something that forms the fabric of an organization's thinking when it comes to digital health and digital transformation. You don't have to be a product company but by having a mindset that aligns with that of product developers and product marketers, I think you can serve your constituencies really, really well. And that's the only comment that I would make as it relates to product development. Yeah, and a couple ideas. And again, we're, we're trying to make this practical. The model, as I said, is free. It won't work for everyone the way it is. Make adjustments based on your organization and your strategies. The, the I mean, a couple easy things here though is you probably work with someone already that has an innovation lab. Uh, so when we, when I didn't have access to an innovation lab, there were some vendors that had them and we took advantage of them, even just to get away and do a retreat and to think about new things and how, how startups operate. Um, so you can go to startup incubators for the same sort of help. We have uh, some innovation labs that are pretty amazing that, anyone's welcome to. So find someone and, and at least even just get into that mindset. It's, it, it'll be pretty interesting what you might come up with. We, I mentioned physical design earlier and you know I was approached recently by an organization that really had it right in terms of their early thinking in terms of they didn't just want this new experience in terms of software and virtual care but they wanted the whole package like this model represents, including physical design. They realized how important the physical design is to everything. And you only, and this isn't a commercial for Apple, there's other fine products and companies. But if you think about the whole success of Apple, you know, it's design, even things that you can't visibly see and probably never will, it's designed with eloquence, with simplicity, all those sort of things. So you can learn from others on how they did physical design. So this is important to everyone because everyone deals with physical design. So if you're rethinking your, especially post uh, pandemic, you're rethinking your layouts of uh, waiting rooms and things like that, or maybe getting rid of waiting rooms completely, which is probably the ideal thing to do uh, from a user, from a customer patient experience. Uh, physical design is really critical. So, so don't gloss over physical design. It's, it's really important. Uh, it's, it goes back to the sort of an analogy I made earlier that if you can do all the right things, have perfect software and hardware and things like that, but if, if you, and even journey maps, but if you miss the physical and the physical becomes a barrier, then you've not really gained much. Uh, I, think, uh, I, yeah, I see ahead. some questions have come through. Do you want to, do you want to maybe take uh, one or two of the questions that have come through? Yeah, go, go for it, Patty. All right. Uh, I'm going to read off of, uh, this list here, let's start with this one. The question here is, uh, within the experience of human-centered design model, where do ancillary healthcare providers such as pharmacies and laboratories fit? Yeah, so what, like I mentioned earlier, is be as inclusive as possible when thinking about the experience and the design, because it's not the patient is central, obviously, but so are the clinicians. And so having everyone work together, and as I mentioned, like if you're doing, if you're designing with a, with a human-centered sort of mindset, 
including everyone in your workshops, in your journey maps, and make sure that what you develop, just because it's great for the patient, but is very cumbersome on the back end for the clinician for ancillary uh, services, that's not a good thing. You can have both. So if you include everyone in the design, there's where you get the best outcomes. So that's how I would approach that one. Yeah, I, if, you know, if I may just add one comment to that, I think if you look at uh, the patient journey in terms of uh, the opportunities for digital engagement, the touch points, if you will, for digital engagement, there's certainly an opportunity to provide uh, pharmacy related services or uh, lab related services. You know, even simple things like making lab results available online through an app can go a long way and you can save people a lot of time and effort and trouble. Uh, you know, online pharmacies are now becoming uh, uh, a focus area for a lot of health systems that I'm working with. Uh, you know, they want to offer uh, the opportunity for patients to go into an online pharmacy store as part of their digital patient experience. Yeah. So there's ways to really look at what has traditionally been a brick and mortar kind of in-person kind of an experience and see if there are ways to digitalize some of those touch points. And you know, even if you're not able to digitalize the entire experience, you know, even if you can do parts of it, it's still, a, it's still you know, a leap forward in my view. All right, let's keep going, Ed, and we'll come back to more questions. I think there are a few more. We'll come back, come back to that. Yeah, we're almost finished, and we'll have time at the end as well for, for Q&A. Uh, so the last two areas, and you know, obviously the one after digital design is virtual care, which is probably top of mind for everyone. Everyone's done a great job, by and large, uh, in the response to the pandemic. So digital design is, uh, is key as well. And uh, Patty, do you want to pick one thing here in terms of digital design and what people should be thinking about? I think, uh, you know, I'll take the first one, oh, once again, user personas, right? Understand your user personas really well. And it, you know, it's, it's, it may seem like a relatively simple and straightforward thing, but, there, but it's a lot of work and you want to get a really comprehensive view of your personas. We are right now working with a, uh, with a health system where we're developing something like 25 or 30 different personas. And each one of those personas has to be carefully uh, developed and then you have to also map out their journeys. So you know exactly what kind of experiences they want to see for themselves, uh, what kind of experiences they're going through today. Look at the gaps and define your future state in a way that helps you develop the experience using technology tools of your choice, and whether it is you know, the web, the mobile application, or anything else uh, that is digital but the personas and the user journeys are really a starting point for you to define your ideal state, your future state, if you will. And that's where I would, uh, I would lay a lot of emphasis and focus. So yeah. start with that in mind, but really it's the personas and the user journeys that are going to drive the experience at the end of the day. And then I, I always to ask people, you know, what, what companies are you having a great digital experience with? And then ask yourself why, and then how you might replicate that for your own hospital or health system. And so if you find yourself in particular, you know, engage with a particular company and the online experience, you know, Amazon is, is often bring, brought up as an example, then think about that as you design and you know, stay human-centered focus and you make that design. Think about that experience. What is it about that experience? So there's a lot of self-analysis you know, with your teams that you can do to come up with that design. And the rest of these things are really about, you know, setting up the wireframes and prototyping and those sorts of things. So let's, let's end with the last, uh, the last area, virtual care. Here's just some examples of what people think about with virtual care. Again, we could have 30, 40 different things here. Uh, Patty, you want to pick one and then I'll pick one and we'll sort of uh, wrap up. Sure. So you saved the best for the last, Ed. I think uh, we are, uh, you know, we are uh, very much in an era of virtual care now. And the pandemic has accelerated the shift towards virtual care as we spoke uh, earlier on in this conversation. One of the big things that is emerging out of virtual care or, or the shift to virtual care 
is the need for health systems to engage with their patients in an omni-channel, omni-channel way. So, you know, it used to be that maybe you, you know, you had your inbound communications through an IVR, and then you had your outbound communication, you had people following up, you know, you had your patient access representatives or whoever following up, making phone calls, maybe sending a, you know, a letter, or maybe an occasional SMS message. But what it, what is required today, I think, is a complete redefinition and a reimagination of the patient engagement and uh, patient experience in the context of an omnichannel strategy. So everything is in place, you, you know, your IVRs, your SMS, your mobile, your a web portal, everything is in play. And there's lots of different tools available. And so uh, my recommendation would be to define the end state in terms of the ideal experience from a patient engagement standpoint and uh, use a multitude of uh, uh, modalities and technology options to deliver the, absolutely the, the best quality experience that you can possibly deliver. And that's what's really gonna make a difference going forward. Yeah, and I think everyone knows because of the pandemic, you know, you, we've all seen the statistics and the growth and hopefully because of the great work Chime is doing and the advocacy as well as what uh, my peers are doing, other CIOs around the, the country, you know, continue to work with uh, their politicians and making sure that the reimbursement and some of the relaxation of key, key laws uh, stay in place so that virtual care can continue where it's desired. The, the big one for me is, you know, sort of that hospital at home or remote patient monitoring. I, I think that's the future. We are headed there anyways, things just got accelerated. And this is just the capability again to fit for things that you would have normally been admitted to a hospital, you won't be admitted in the future. Or if you are admitted, uh, you might be discharged in half the time of the past, uh, but you'll go home with a kit of some sort of Bluetooth kit to monitor your your wellness and your well-being and your your healing process. So, uh, so obviously, we're again the model is here for you. You'll adjust the virtual care piece and the other pieces to best fit your particular strategies. But those are just some that we wanted to uh, highlight. And and really, it was just what we basically talked about is is this sort of continuum, Patty. Everything from kiosks you know people have had kiosks for a long time never very successful maybe the time is right now especially if they're, if you do immunity passports or you know covid testing type things uh telehealth obviously uh remote patient monitoring we covered the virtual hospital virtual physical therapy i'm actually receiving uh virtual physical therapy i i'm i'm a big runner and i tweak my knee and so it is so much nicer to do it from the comfort of my home. I will never, uh, my PT is a little frustrated with me because our health system where I receive my care, they want me to come back. There's like, hey, we're, we're open back for business. Please come in. And I'm like, no, no, I really don't want to come in. And now there's the tools that you can do very finite measurements uh, with physical therapy. And then the whole senior care and wellness, this is not a commercial. This is just a nice, easy graphic to kind of see the end-to-end -end capabilities that probably all of us all of us online here are probably looking to implement. And you get some of that from your EHR vendor, uh, and then you might get a a most of it from a multitude of other vendors. So, but this is a sort of virtual care platform. I think a lot of people are looking to create for their hospital and health system. And it goes back, the last thing I'll say about this, Patty, and we'll go to additional questions, is really uh, thinking about user, the user, again, the human centered design and make it as easy and as seamless for your patients and for your caregivers. So rather than have, I was talking with a, a venture capitalist firm the other day and they were showing me all the investments they made into all these different very specific apps. And I, and my comment back was while the, those specific apps may be really beneficial to that patient and designed well, most patients have multiple things going on. And so they would have to have five, 10 different apps. And even hospitals are dealing with that, right? I know you've done some work there where people are, you know, find themselves with 30, 40 websites and they're trying to consolidate to yeah. one, again, to make it seamless, frictionless, and transparent to the user. So we'll, we'll end here with questions. Um, 
you can get in contact with me if I could be of any more help. I think Patty's, uh, Patty's contact information was on the first slide, which, or second slide, which everyone will get access to. So uh, Patty, are there any other questions that we, sh we have to address? Otherwise we'll uh, turn it back over to Aaron. I think I'll just turn it over to Aaron. I think there were a few, uh, Aaron, if you want to open it up. And sure, we can. yeah. I can see a couple that you guys might not be able to. Um, first, I will say there was um, a comment here, uh, just commenting on what you guys had posted, stating, defining digital transformation is much like defining innovation for an organization. Many times responses have been similar to, I'll know it when I see it. So I agree, it is about the customer-centered experience. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. Um, and now the next question I had that came through, uh, so I know I need to do something for digital transformation, but just not quite sure what. Where do you suggest to start, or what would you say is the first step to take? Yeah, I think, I think one of the first things to do, obviously you need to work with, uh, it has to start with the CEO. I'm a big believer that digital transformation is not an IT thing. It's an enterprise. Uh, it comes, it starts in the C-suite, starts with the CEO. And so the first thing is to get the buy-in and the direction from the CEO and then work closely. So if you're fortunate enough to be asked to sort of lead digital transformation, you have to work with your peers uh, very closely and collaboratively for success. Again, transformation, digital transformation is not an IT thing, although there's a lot of IT components and a lot of accelerators that come out of IT. So uh, when, when, I, when I was with my previous employer, I was given that uh, role and responsibility, which I cherished and worked, that's exactly what I did, worked directly with the C-suite, got everyone engaged and started working with the patients and all the things that we spoke about. Okay, thank you. Um, so next I have, um, so two things to, wait, so I have two things at once. I'm wanting to reduce costs and increase virtual care, which, what would you do? Yeah, that's why, and Patty, you can certainly feel free to follow up after me if you have a different viewpoint. I, I believe you have to be bimodal. That, that's what I, my entire career has been doing three things at the same time. It was reduce costs of the organization. So a lot of them in IT, but how else do you leverage technology to reduce costs for the enterprise? Uh, increase customer satisfaction and and then digitally transform we may not have called it digital transformation 10 years ago but that's essentially what it was so i think an effective cio has to be able to do all three at the same time so you have to go on all of it so one one easy thing to do so if you're really stuck and trying to figure out oh, well how do i fund these things that i really need to do for the organization but our budget keeps getting slashed is look at the areas and these are all things that i've done in the past so don't be, please do not think this is a commercial is i've gone to manage services some in my past uh, the other thing that really is is fruitful and i've done some of this analysis in my past is um, is the whole concept of uh, workstation as a service i think it was one of the things that we uh, addressed or at least was highlighted and that is you know you can put if you manage your it's simple, it's simple, right? If you manage, because everyone has a desktop or laptop of some sort, and you're paying big fees for licensing. If you manage that well, it's just like the cloud. That was a comment Patty made about the cloud. If you manage that well, you can take out significant costs. So like I've seen uh, like 25% on average costs and think about how much you might pay for all your licensing for all your devices and all your devices. If you can take out 25% and go back to the, your C-suite peers, the CFO, and say, look, I'm able to reduce 25% of this large spend, and I want to return 15% of that back to the organization, as an example, and take this 10% and invest in virtual care or something of that nature. The, I've always found that to be a very successful way of funding new things, is by taking costs out of someplace else, giving a lot of those, those dollars back to the organization, but then reapplying uh, a percentage into the future. Okay, um, thank you. Next question I have that came through is, 
where did you implement this model? What kind of hospitals have adopted this model? Yeah, so the, the full-blown model, I don't know of anyone yet who's, that I've seen, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and I'm sure many of my peers have done it, I just haven't seen it, a, a full implementation of a digital transformation strategy. And I'll ask Patty, Patty has a lot of experience and done a lot of interviews, so it'll be interesting to, to yeah. hear his comments. So I, I was very fortunate in that we were able to develop a model and, and start moving and executing that model. And actually Patty helped me uh, with, with uh, some of that. So the, the thing is you have to get the model. That's why we created the model was to give people a head start and start moving on it. So again, hadn't seen anyone do it before, haven't seen a holistic model like that uh, based on the organizations that I've been with and my new organization have had had the skills to surround myself with and the companies to surround myself with to actually lay that out and put it forward. So Patty, what about you? I, I know that you've interviewed a lot of yeah. I, I would, yeah, so I would say, look, you know, you don't have to do this all at the same time. Uh, this is your, this is, if you have a long-term, if you want to develop a long-term vision for your enterprise, these are all the components that are going to enable the achievement of that vision. Now, you may have near-term priorities that are driven partly by the pandemic, partly by your market, partly by your population, or your financial condition, whatever it is. But pick whatever makes the most sense for you, keeping the end in mind. The end is really a, a large-scale transformation of the enterprise to prepare for a, a digital future. And, uh, you know, Ed, I know you, you, you use this expression a lot, the survival of the digital fittest. Right? And, it doesn't mean that you do it all today or immediately, but you, you got to have some kind of an end game in mind where you transform your organization and your enterprise to be the survivor when everything is said and done. And we may be looking at three or five years out, start somewhere, start where it makes the most sense. If it's cloud, it's cloud. If it's telehealth, it's telehealth. If it's AI, it's AI. Wherever you start, make, it, make sure that you're have the visibility to all of the different components that are going to enable the organization to move towards uh, your future state. And so, you know, when I look at uh, organizations across uh, the across the country, especially the large ones that I've worked with, they've all approached it kind of in a similar way. And uh, Ed, you know, in your own roadmap, which you and I worked on, we never intended to execute all of them at the same time, but we did have a roadmap. We knew where we wanted to go and over what period of time, and we knew what it was going to cost the enterprise. Right? We had a rough idea. So you lay those you know, building blocks, so one, one alongside the other, and you make your way towards your end goal. That's kind of how I would approach it. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so we have a comment and a question that came through. So first, the comment that came through says, I love the holistic approach and appreciate your valuable information. Thank you so much. The question that we received is, who do you feel should be leading this digital transformation? Yeah, we actually address that in the book as well, because that's a common question. And I, I always say it's just a matter of leadership. And so I think it can be led from multiple parts of the organization. I do believe that the most senior leader needs to be a member of the C-suite. And only because of what I mentioned earlier, it has to start with the CEO. It has to be enterprise and, and fully empowered to make things happen uh, because this is huge change management. So I think it needs to be a member of the C-suite. I think, you know, Chime, we often talk about the CIO 3.0. If you are a CIO 3.0, which sort of the, you know, understands digital transformation, understands leadership, collaboration, all those sorts of things, yeah, that's an excellent place because, again, a lot of this is reliant on technology. It's not all technology, but reliant on technology, and, and there's a lot of levers you can pull. So I love it when, when organizations ask their CIOs to make transformation happen. You just have to be sure that it's never a technical project. It's never centered around technology, but it's all the things we spoke about today. 
you should be able to come into a, you should as a stranger be able to come in as a C, come into a C-suite and watch the dynamics like maybe of a staff meeting or something and not be able to pick out the CIO. And, uh, and that's, so if you're at that level, I think you're in an excellent position to lead digital transformation. Patty, do you have uh, any other insights? Yeah, no, this is a, this is a great question. And I can, I can provide uh, some insights based on the research that my firm has done. In fact, if anyone is interested, we actually have a white paper on the different uh, org models that are out there to drive digital transformation in health systems. You can go to my website, democonsulting.net and uh, go through the uh, knowledge center and you'll find the white paper there. You can, it's a complimentary document, you can download it. But I will tell you, it is a work in progress. There's a two or three things that are playing out today in the marketplace. And you can decide what is, you know, what is the right for your organization. Uh, number one, we're seeing a trend where dedicated roles are being created for chief digital officer. And uh, these roles often report directly up into the CEO. Uh, and increasingly, these roles are filled by individuals who are not from healthcare. So they come from outside. They come typically from industries which are, which have mature uh, B2C kind of models where there's a great understanding and focus on how to uh, delight, uh, create delightful consumer experiences. So that is one trend that we're seeing. The other trend that I'm seeing uh, lately is that because uh, the pandemic has forced us to think more about telehealth and virtual care models and about redefining the patient care, ex patient experience in, in light of virtual care models. The patient experience officers, or whoever has responsibility for patient experiences, they are stepping into the roles to drive digital transformation, at least in the near term. Uh, CIOs, a large number of CIOs are also playing the role of chief digital officers. So that goes without saying. And uh, one more thing that we're also now beginning to see is that uh, uh, to your point, Ed, you know, the, di you know, the digital transformation officer is uh, increasingly somebody who has the ability to build bridges across different parts of the organization, be able to read the organizational dynamics, bring people together and be an active enabler and facilitator uh, by defining the, you know, the goals, the roadmap, and then being an active enabler for implementing the roadmap. So there's different models that uh, we are seeing out there. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, there isn't a right or wrong, you know, go with whatever makes the most sense in your organizational context. Yeah, and Chime has a great program coming up. Again, not doing commercials, but they have a great program coming up to help uh, CIOs make that transition. So I would definitely recommend that as well as a good resource. Well, it looks like that's the last of the questions and we are at the top of the hour. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, Ed, and thank you, Patty, for presenting for us today. This was a great and informative session. I just want to thank all of the attendees for joining us. Please be sure to fill out that survey form for us and let us know what you thought of the content. If you have any additional questions, feel free to type in the questions in that survey. We can gladly answer that for you. Um, so any closing remarks, Ed? No, Aaron, thanks again for having us and thank you, uh, Chime, and thank you for all of you who are listened in and thank you for your leadership in your organizations. Great, well, I hope everyone has a really great afternoon and join us for future programming. Have a great day.